Hey everybody, this is Brad Duck, saying hi. Um, it's going to be a little short to this time, but I uh, wanted to give you a, basically a progress report on a couple of tests I'm doing right now on the hardware side. And then we'll do a quick blurb on the software side, and then I'll send this out to everybody. So, i um, been experimenting a little bit with some of my legacy motherboards, and I have a, quite a few of them, roughly about 25, 30 of them. Uh, these are older motherboards that are in the much smaller footprints, but they still function and they are still compatible because of their nature, but it's just a little harder to make them work. Anyways, what I'm referring to specifically is this giant monster I built. As you can see, right now I've disconnected all the cabling again. I've got up here the platform board. It's an older series board. And as you can notice that by the nature of the original PCIe set over here, which is, this is AGP, and then down here we start progressing to PCIe 1, and PCIe 2, 2, 3, and 3 at the bottom. So we've got three threes, one, one, uh, two, well, another one here, and an AGP style footprint right here, and no... I'm not pulling the Visa Local Bus out, though that's pretty cool. But if you want to see what I mean by Visa Local Bus, here's one of the brethren of it, uh, of the old days, and that is, this is a Dell 300 platform. Um, you know, it's just after the P3, but before the heavy Xeons out there, and there's the processor right there. It's, it's traditional style. RAM set, uh, you know, no more than 8 gigs. You could tr you could trick it into 16, but it's a very basic PCI board with an AGP output. I decided not to add that one because of its uh, pre-Xeon component. But uh, these are all basically i5s or better. So um, as you can see, their class coolers are normal grade. It's not a big deal because... Uh, the goal was was to baseline them, boot a basic footprint off, and to make them work the way I want them to. So, with that, uh, yeah, it's been a little tricky because unlike the PCIe's down here, I have PCI up here. And uh, so the functionalities are somewhat limited. Uh, but the cool thing is, is bringing all these guys into a Proxmox model, just to see what the heck, you know. And this can really, truly bring a lot of hardware up to spec. Now, when regards, you know, we're dealing with, with basically, um, three, four, five, we got six motherboards here. So you'd have to use a split PDU and then a quad PDU to support these effectively. Uh, the quad PDU could just do you know straight splitters, uh, which could power the first four, and then the dual PDU can power the last two. But those would be ATX; these are ATXEs. So you have to separate the output on those. Right now, I'm just doing them manually one at a time, just to get them to be able to be in a state where they're going to do what I want them to do. Now, this is what I was talking about: reinventing the nature of old hardware into new roles motherboard manufacturers and newer technology manufacturers don't want you to do this to be honest with you they don't want you to take your old stuff and try to repurpose it they want you to go out and buy new stuff because that's what keeps them in business and i get that that's okay that's legitimate and that's survival and i get that but there's a middle place in the middle right where we can all survive and thrive and reach you know to the next level so that's why one of the reasons why I was building this out is because I do have a mix of newer motherboards with older motherboards, but looking for the common x86 MMX extension models to be able to get me to be able to do a few cool things. Um, as it's known, CPUs work more efficiently than GPUs when it comes to the cloud clustering environments, so that's why I bring them into the equation. Six of these boards are the equivalency of 12 GPUs, so why not, right? It can't hurt. You know, we basically work with what we call the generic low-profile heat sinks to give us what we need on the core basis because we have a copper core. And that allows us to have the footprint as small as possible. Then at that point in stage, we can use PCI and PCIe 
base ports, bridge cards, or straight SATA bridge connections, which would work with the following. That being the basic SATA output style M.2 standard template for SATA interface right there. And this would allow you to be able to really basically get these things to post, get an IP, get them into a mode, get them configured with some capacity, and prepare them for the ability to do this. Now, the last thing about this which we have to talk about is the fact of its functional compatibility uh, in an environment. So this is roughly almost two plus feet in height. It's pretty high, but it does work. And this is the lowest possible footprint that you can get without fan assistance. So we're looking at a fairly healthy model here that will allow plenty of air circulation and allow things to accomplish. Now, you got to understand that these i5s here are ranging from second to seventh generation, right? Where this guy over here are ninth generation i5s. And he's got the same firepower. So I'm not doing this because I am trying to outperform these because these are powerful enough by themselves. Uh, all I would do is just buy more of the 7040s to add to this com complication so that I would have a fairly hefty you know, cluster environment. The reason why I made this beast that you see here is for you. You guys asked, hi, hey, how can we keep reinventing ourselves? How can we think outside the box? How, come, how can we make necessity something enjoyable not something that's absolutely needed and this is a way to look at that so hopefully this is something of interest to you guys um i will eventually break this down and put these back in their storage boxes uh for now and uh, but i wanted to show you how i did this and literally i kid you not all i did was use these basic hex nut sets right here in sequence and uh, also the low profile ones, which are these. And they're in the bottom, right here. And that's it. That's all I had to do to get this accomplished. Uh, if you use the proper extenders on the power output connectors, which will allow you to be able to provide power, which is located over here on the back side, as you see right there and there and so on. Um, each of those connectors, if you have the proper extenders, will not distress this structure to any major degree. So that's really cool. Now there's a little wiggle, as you can see, but you really have to work at it to get a wiggle. So this is good This is good reinforcement. The only other thing I could possibly think of that would help reinforce this is a cross-functional support. Probably a feed wire from here down to here, and then from here down to here on both sides and that would give it some pressure that would make the wiggling a lot less possible but like i said uh this is huge it's, it wouldn't go in a rack it's just really just some fun that i was doing with this and, you know guys give me some ideas of what you think about this uh it does work it's not so pretty when you put all the wires back on it but you know we're only basically using a network wire in the back not even anything else, no USB or anything like that, and power. And the rest is just done remotely via by a pre-boot configuration process. And that's pretty much it. So with that being said, the next question is going to come up. What do I do with this stuff? Well, I'll tell you what. If you learn how to do what we call true hot, hot clustering, in other words, two or three motherboards are running in a paired set on a set of network cards that will allow you to run hot. In other words, no matter which node is operational, all of them are load balancing between the three of them, giving you three times functionality as well as a failover capacity. Uh, it's a cheap way to take old motherboards to do some cluster testing. That's it. You know, first start off with the most basic cluster testing, and that is red, green, or hot, cold clusters and that's basically one hot, hot server or one motherboard that's hot and one that's on standby that's ready to replace it if for any reason anything happens then you can run what's called TTL uh, restriction DNS testing models to basically cause one to fail and watch the TTLs kick over to your failover 
and then build from there. You can do paired hot, which is basically one or the other is doing the work, but neither is doing both work. Or you can do what's called adaptive load balancing clustering, which means they're sharing the workloads in a sequential or asequential process. Uh, you won't find very successful models with round robin clustering. That's not necessarily a great approach. But with that being said, um, that's just one possibility. You know, FS, uh, PFSense is another great example for this. Um, you can put low profile NICs on the PCIEs or the PCI buses, and you can build yourself a redundancy uh, PFSense cluster pairing. So you can start looking at cross busing your network. So if you have a uh, one initial path and it fails, the PII mode will kick in and you can reroute that through the alternate pathway of your other board. So there's some really cool things you can do with very little overhead, just a network cable, a bootable media, maybe even a USB drive. It's very simple. Uh, and then you can do the rest uh, remotely via by secure shell. So think about these ideas. This is Brad Dyke signing off. I'm going to work on my software part of this equation next so that you guys will have those videos. Thanks and God bless.